that. Um, I have a very happy task tonight, and that's to uh, offer a, a, a welcome from the museum uh, for this particular activity. It's a wonderful uh, series of lectures that we've got going. My name, by the way, is Roger Lanius. I'm Associate Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, the most visited museum in the world. We never get tired of telling you that. I hope you're enjoying your evening here. Uh, this is the Exploring Space series of lectures. We do this every year. Uh, it is a pleasure to, uh, to be able to host this, and it's made possible by a generous support of our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United uh, Launch Alliance. Both companies have been instrumental in launching and propelling many of the spacecraft to the far reaches of the solar system. And we have representatives from those organizations here tonight, and I'd like to ask them to stand up, please. And it's okay to clap. <laughs> And thank you all. Uh, before we continue with the program, I would like to call your attention, I'm sure you saw it as you came in tonight, our new Milestones of Flight Hall, which is a construction site. You probably noticed that as well. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's starting to take shape, and on the 1st of July, we will open the re-envisioned Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. We're very excited about this. And uh, we would invite you back immediately after that over the, over the Capitol 4th or whatever, uh, whatever time you would like to come and participate with us to see this new gallery. And I should also indicate that there will be a night at the museum associated with the opening of this gallery. Activities associated with that will be on our website very shortly. So you might want to mark your calendar. Our speaker tonight, as you already know, is Dr. Chris McKay. He's a planetary scientist, uh, astrophysicist, and as you know, quite a fine story storyteller from NASA Ames Research Center in California, the farthest center away from the NASA headquarters. <laughs> this evening, he's going to tell us about searching for life in the solar system. His research focuses on the evolution of the solar system and the origins of life. He's been involved in planning NASA missions, as a scientist associated with them and uh, working toward this fundamental answer to the question that we all have, are we alone in the universe? He's done research in Mars-like environments on Earth, traveling to Antarctica, uh, to Siberia, the Canadian Arctic, and a variety of other places. He's a co-investigator on the Huygens probe uh, to Saturn's moon Titan in 2005, the Mars Phoenix lander in 2006, uh, and other missions beyond that. So please welcome and give your attention to Dr. McKay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, good to talk to you again. Uh, I want to start by thanking the museum for inviting me. Uh, when Priscilla emailed me <clears throat> and asked me if I would give the inaugural talk in this series, this is a series of talks, on the search for life. I was really excited to accept for two reasons. One is that this is my favorite museum in the whole world, hands down. I really love this place. Uh, yeah, it's really great to, 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 to come here, uh, any excuse. And the other reason is that uh, we are, I think, in a, at a turning point in the planetary program where we are seriously starting to search for life. Uh, we, you could, mission calls are being posted right now for missions to be built that have as their explicit goal the search for extant life. That is, to me personally, that's terribly exciting. And so I want to share with you my perspective on that. What, what can we be doing soon? Uh, how might we make progress on this? Eventually, we're going to search the whole solar system. But what I want to focus on is these two targets, Mars and Enceladus, and I'll talk why. The short answer why I focus on those two targets is because those two, we already can check the habitability box. So it's clear that the thing to do next is go search for life. So that's what motivates me. What I want to do is talk a little bit about what I, what I think we could call the scientific context for the search for life. Well, like what are we searching for? 
why, how do we search, and what if we find it? Uh, so I want to start with what, what are we searching for and why, sort of the big picture. Uh, and, and here I want to make the distinction between searching for life, which is interesting, but what I'm really interested in, what drives me, is the search for a second genesis of life. Uh, and you can see from the word second genesis that what I'm talking about is life not as we know it. Uh, again, motivated by Star Trek, I want to be able to say, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Right? <laughs> and what is life as we know it? This is life as we know it. This is the tree of life. All life forms on Earth map onto one tree showing the phylogenetic and biochemical unity of life on Earth. It is one of the amazing icons of science from the last 50 years. This particular tree is based on comparing RNA, strands of RNA. And it shows that life falls into these three big domains. The green domain is plants and animals, and then these two domains are the microscopic uh, so-called prokaryotic organisms. That's life, life as we know it. What we're searching for, what I'm searching for, what, what I've been, is something that's not on our tree of life. And that is, uh, in some sense, an operational definition of alien. An alien is not defined geographically. Uh, if there's an organism on Mars and it maps on our tree of life, it's not an alien. Uh, if there's an organism in your backyard that doesn't map on the tree of life, then it is an alien. It doesn't need to come to me from Mexico or anything. It's, <laughs> It's not a geographic definition, it's a biochemical definition. So we know what we're looking for. We're looking for things that don't map on our tree of life. Now, technically I should add in the footnotes here that viruses aren't on this diagram, but they fit into the picture. They're made out of the same genetic material. We just don't know where to draw their lines. Why am I interested in searching for a second genesis? Well, there's two reasons. One is comparative biochemistry. And I'll come back to this later when I talk about the implications of what we might find. Everything we know about medical, agricultural, biochemical, pest control, microbial resistance to antibiotics, et cetera, is based on studying one example of life. Right? These are sciences that are incredibly important to our human well-being. And they're all rooted in one data point, one example of life. There might be enormous knowledge gains to be had by having life 2.0. And for those of you who are in school, you probably got a big fat book, Leninger, Biochemistry. Now you could have two big fat books, Biochemistry and Biochemistry 2.0. How much fun would that be? Right? <laughs> so that's potentially important science and practical uh, knowledge. But there's also a deep philosophical point here. If we find that in our solar system, life started twice, then we know we have compelling evidence that life is common in the universe. Right? And I cite the theorem. It's the one, two, zero, one infinity rule. Uh, and that's basically, it's a rule that's mostly been taken over by computer scientists now. If you Google zero, one infinity rule, you'll be given over to some computer science pages. But the origin of the re rule really traces back to another wonderful science fiction book. We were talking about science fiction books earlier. Isaac Asimov's book, The Gods Themselves. And I believe, as I recall, he was talking about deities. He says that the only numbers that make sense when you're talking about things like that in the universe are zero, there can be zero of them, or there can be one of them, or there can be an infinite number. There's not going to be 13 or 21 or 6, right? And the same with life. There may, we know it's not zero. We know that there's at least one example of life. This is it. My, I take my goal in life is to get to two, right? If I get to two, then I know it's an infinity. So I, my job description is counting from one to two. That's it. If I can get to two, I can, I can quit. And someone else can fill out the details, three, four, five, six, all the way up to infinity. It's getting to two, that first example of another independent origin of life. That is, to me, the exciting prospect. And planetary science is one of the key ways we can do that. I want to show you what are the list of ways that we, we human society, are trying to get another example of life. There's really three. Uh, we're SETI. Wait for them to call. Listen for them to call. Uh, or make it in the laboratory. Um, 
Now, I'm not very good with the phone. If you ever call my office, you'll realize that. Uh, and since I used a hammer for the icon for the laboratory, you know that I'm not a lab rat. Uh, so the third approach is the approach that I'm going to talk about, which is go find it. And I like it because it's proactive. We go do it. We go do something. Uh, and we now, we, human society, NASA, have the technology to do that. We can go to these worlds and we can search for a second genesis of life. That is, as I said earlier, uh, very, very exciting. And these are the two worlds in particular. But there's others that, uh, that are of interest too. So let me now put the bigger picture in, in more detailed context. We're talking about a separate origin of life. Well, how did the life that we have get started? What was the origin of life number, of the one data point we have? Unfortunately, we have no idea. We don't know how life started. The only fact we have about the origin of life on Earth is that it happened more than three and a half billion years ago. That we know is a fact from the fossil record on Earth, but that's the only fact that we know. And we have a weak indication of the continuity of life on Earth since that time. Uh, so we don't have any evidence of multiple origins. But that's all we know. We don't know where life started. A lot of researchers just assume that it started on Earth, but we have no evidence to support that. We don't know when it started, other than it started earlier than that. We don't know how it started, and we don't know how long it took. Uh, other than that, we know a lot. right? Uh, so there's a common view when you talk to most origin of life researchers. They have a common, sometimes even unspoken assumption that it occurred on Earth and that it took a long time. But that there's no evidence to support that in any direct way. Now, a lot of things for which there's no evidence to support turn out to be true. But a lot of things for which there's no evidence for su or support turn out to be false, too. So we, we can't uh, really conclude. How are we going to advance our understanding of the origin of life the one example we have, and search for another example, we need more data. Uh, theory isn't going to do it. We need more data. We need to go to other worlds and see if life started there. And I'm going to first talk about these other worlds and why I think the time is right to go to these worlds, uh, particularly Mars and Enceladus, now and search for life directly, and then how we might learn answers to our questions from that search. Uh, so let's start with Mars. Uh, Mars is really a very special world. Uh, here is an artist's conception of what it looked like billions of years ago. And this is why Mars is so exciting to us in astrobiology, because at one time it looked like Earth. And by that I mean it had all the environments that Earth has. But however you think life, if you think life started on Earth, then it should have started on Mars too, because Mars was just like Earth during the time life first appeared on Earth. Uh, why doesn't Mars look like this now? The short answer is it's too small. And we know that size matters. We learned that in the political campaign. Size matters, and it matters for planets as well. Right? Mars is 10 times smaller than the Earth, and as a result of its size, not its distance from the sun, but as a result of its size, it has no plate tectonics, less gravity, and no magnetic field. And all of those factors cause it to lose its atmosphere and become cold and frozen, the world we see today. So that's an, a, a one slide theory or, or a summary of why Mars is interesting and why it uh, isn't Earth-like anymore. Uh, now, we've learned, we've, two recent missions to Mars have shown us where Mars was habitable in the recent and ancient past. We have particular places we could go to and say, there was habitable. Let's look for evidence of life there. The first of those missions was Phoenix, which landed in the polar regions and dug down the ground ice. Now, Mars right now is tilted such that this ground ice location on Phoenix is very cold even in the summer. Mars is in an ice age right now. But we know that five million years ago, Mars was tilted such that these, this region this place where this ground ice would be getting twice as much summer sunlight as it's getting now. So the sunlight at this spot on Mars, where this ground ice is located, got, gets twice as much sunlight five million years ago as it does now. That means it's getting as much sunlight as the corresponding polar regions on Earth. 
And so we go to the corresponding polar regions on Earth and study life there. And we can point to places on Earth and say these places are good analogs for what Mars, the Phoenix site, would have been like five million years ago. Not today, but five million years ago, and find life there. And this diagram shows that. This is sort of a schematic. We're colder and drier. And here is the Arctic in the warmest, wettest corner. And you know it's warm and wet because there's a little bunny rabbit hopping across the road. Right? But as you get to Antarctica, it gets colder and drier, the coastal Antarctica. And you get up in the high valleys, in the high mountains of the dry valleys of Antarctica. It's the coldest, driest place on Earth. It's the place where we cross the line between liquid water and water only as ice and vapor. And in those valleys, we see conditions like Mars would have seen five million years ago. Nowhere on Earth can we get to Mars today. But we can get to Mars five million years ago and see life there and make the case for the habitability of these cold polar regions when Mars was at a higher obliquity. So this is the first site we would go, right there, drill down into this ice. Phoenix was not able of doing, to do that. It had an arm, but the arm couldn't penetrate the ice. And the ice is where the record is going to be. So this is going to be a recurring theme on Mars, is to get to the record, we're going to have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? Here, we want to go deeper into ice. Drilling into ice takes a strong drill. We need to work on it. The second site where we know that there was habitability, now not millions of years ago, but billions of years ago, is at the Curiosity landing site in Gale Crater. This is now my favorite picture of Mars, from Mars. It's taken at the Yellowknife Bay site, uh, essentially at the bottom of what used to be a lake bed on Mars. But I like this picture because it illustrates in a visual way why Mars is so compelling to us. If you look at that picture, and if you've ever driven that stretch of highway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, you recognize the scene. You passed it many times. Mars brings, us, brings back memories to us. It looks familiar when we look at it. None of the other worlds bring, do that, at least not for me. E even the moon. The moon, the sharp shadows and contrasts, they're beautiful, but in an alien sort of way. Mars is beautiful in a familiar sort of way. And I think that's part of the reason we send more spacecraft to Mars than all the other planets put together, is because the landscape calls to us. And I, on the theme of science fiction books, one of my favorites is Ray Bradbury, uh, The Martian Chronicles. And the reason that book is such an enduring classic, it's still number one on Google lists for Mars science fiction books, is because of its description of the landscapes. The plot's pretty pathetic, and a lot of it's dated. But the description of the landscapes are just spectacular. And he, he, he really writes landscapes. And Mars shows us landscapes. And if you've never been to Death Valley, go, because you'll get that same view. Uh, sandstones and rocks and distant hills and then mist and then even further hills. Mars calls to us because of his familiarity with these landscapes. But this site is also interesting scientifically. Uh, I think it's the most interesting place on Mars scientifically. Uh, Yellowknife Bay, I describe it as an ideal site for astrobiology. The reason was, was that three and a half million years ago, this was an impact crater, and it filled with water. And here is just another little footnote complaint. I could never get the artists to put the ice in. You remember that uh, Mars and Earth analog picture? It, Earth, Mars looked like it was as warm as Miami Beach. It was cold, and this was cold. So I just photoshopped the ice in myself. <laughs> right? Mars was cold. Even when it was wet, it was cold. Right? Uh, when I say it had water, it had water under ice. But that's fine. As I'll show you, we find places in Antarctica where there's lakes covered with ice and they're full of life. Uh, so there's an ice-covered lake in Gale Crater, uh, 100 miles across, big lake. What happens in a lake? Stuff collects and settles to the bottom, muck on the bottom. Uh, that muck, over time, gets compressed into stone, uh, mudstone. Very innovative na name. Uh, these become hard, compact mudstones. We are driving over them with this rover. Uh, so we're sitting on ground that was formed in a lake three and a half billion years ago and then, and then was buried and has been buried and protected until 70 million years ago when it was exposed by the wind. 
I couldn't imagine a better scene for astrobiology. And I want to make that case by taking you to a place in Antarctica that is my analog for this lake on Mars. So this is a lake in Antarctica, an ice-covered lake. It's, it's called Lake Untersea. And this is our camp on the lake. Uh, and uh, the shore of the lake is essentially lifeless. It's too dry and cold. This is uh, in the, in the uh, interior of Antarctica, too dry and cold for anything to grow. But there's this ice cover there all year round. Uh, we set up camp there. And in our camp, just to, as a little side interest, everything we produce, every bit of water we touch is carried out. Uh, this is the barrel for water and urine collection. And the solids collection is around the corner here in a slightly sheltered spot, which is still uncomfortable and makes you appreciate indoor plumbing. Uh, but enough of that. We were only out there for a month. Who needs a shower for a month? Uh, what we do is we drill through the ice in this lake. The ice is about three meters thick, so uh, uh, th about as tall as I can reach. Uh, we drill holes through the ice and get samples. And you can see the main reason I'm invited on these expeditions is because I'm tall enough to reach the uh, jiffy drill head at the end of the drill hole. Uh, but, but we really learn the most. We really learn the most about this lake when we were the first ones to cut a hole and dive into the lake. Right? Uh, and this is me getting ready to go down and dive into this lake. The first question that comes to everyone's mind is, how cold is the water? Uh, well, it's right at zero degrees, because it's an ice water bath. You can see the ice floating in the dive hole. Uh, and one of the first physics problems we had to solve is, how can you be in an environment where there's three meters of ice, and the temperature at the surface of these lakes can vary from annual average of minus 10 to minus 20. And yet there's water at zero all year round as well. It's an interesting physics problem. And I can give you the, the reference to it if you want to uh, look at the problem. But it's interesting. But the, the lake does persist. This lake, there's three meters of ice. And below it, there's, in the deepest part, over 100 meters of water. But what's interesting is not the water and the cold and swimming in it although it is somewhat entertaining to swim in freezing cold water, uh, it's that on the bottom of this lake, there are mats of microorganisms, mounds. living. Uh, these mounds are about this big, half a meter high. These are masses of microorganisms living in a world that, in some sense, is a throwback to the, what the world was like billions of years ago, before life invented things like fish and tadpoles and algae eaters, that on most environments just eat these. Here, in the isolated lake, there are no fish. There are no tables. There are no grazers. It's, just, it's a world dominated by microbes. Right? It's very, very unusual and very rare. And we see structures there we don't see anywhere else. And so we, as you see here, the bottom of this ice-covered lake is a world of only microscopic life making large mounds. You can see them with your eye, but they're made by microscopic organisms. It's sort of like the microscopic equivalent of pyramids. Uh, and we think these are analogs for early Earth and early Mars. In particular, you could imagine that this ice-covered lake uh, is Gale Crater. Three and a half billion years ago, you've got an ice cover on this lake. Uh, it's really cold and dry over Mars. It's not a place where you can live. But underneath the ice, in the water that can be there below the ice, there could be life. And it's going to die and get included in the sediments and these mudstones um, that we're driving on on Mars could have preserved remnants of these kind of structures in those mudstones. So as you might tell, when we landed on or drove to Gale Crater, we didn't land at Yellowknife Bay. We didn't land on Yellowknife Bay. We had to drive over to it. I was incredibly excited because this is you know, finally a rock on Mars that's interesting. Right? The geologists are all ooh and ah over basalts and volcanic rocks. And who cares? Finally, sedimentary rocks from the bottom of a lake. Yes. Uh, and then, to make it even more interesting, we drilled into it. And there, uh, unfortunately, curiosity can only drill a few inches. But we drilled into it and got to gray stuff. The surface is red. It's gray underneath. You say, well, is that really the level of sophistication you work in on the, at NASA? And it really is. Red to gray. And that's really, again, really exciting. If you go to any desert on Earth and dig down till you go from the reddish crust at the surface of the desert to something dark underneath, 
you're going to know you've hit something organic. It's going to smell like rotten eggs, and you're going to be into the anaerobic zone. Uh, and this looked like we were reaching that. So I was uh, uh, beside myself because I thought, this is just going to be dripping with organics. Uh, if this was Earth, it would, and that's why it's dark. And it's going to smell like rotten eggs if I was there to smell it. Right? Uh, and the time between the drilling and the analysis, which I'll show you in a minute, was about a month and a half. It's just that's how long it takes to do the operations on these kind of rovers. And I was just at the edge of my seat. What are we going to find? We knew that there was a gray Mars underneath the red Mars, and we knew that from the meteorites. Mars meteorites, which are kicked up from deep below the surface, are all gray. They're not red. You look at Mars, it's red. You look at the meteorites, it's gray. And you say, how could they think this came from that planet? It's not red. Well, there's good uh, evidence that they did. So we knew that there was a gray Mars down below, and we got it so easily. I would not have expected or guessed that we'd get to it so easily just in that few inches drill. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not, ooh, rich in organic. Something happened to my slide here. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a slide. The key points, though, are illustrated here. I'm showing a graph of the results from the analysis. And sure enough, when we heat up the sample, hydrogen sulfide is released. That's what this arrow points to, a little bump in that data showing hydrogen sulfide release. That's the rotten egg smell. So this sample is releasing highly reduced gases, the proverbial rotten egg smell from the anaerobic zone, just what you'd expect. But at the same time, it's releasing gaseous oxygen. Now, that's just not something that is released from soils on Earth. And that goes back to our discussion before the talk about the perchlorate and the rocket fuel and Robinson Crusoe on Mars, the 1961 movie. Uh, there are, the soils on Mars release oxygen when they're heated up. So how could it be that this most oxidized form and this most reduced form are coexisting in the same sample? It makes no sense, and we really don't understand it. And there weren't very many organics, much to my disappointment. I think the answer is, and this is something we're still working on, radiation. Radiation is what's producing these oxidative extremes simultaneously and destroying the organics. That means to get to the remnants of this lake bed, we have to go deeper. Deeper so that we're below the level of radiation damage. Apparently, even the 70 million years of damage has been enough. That means we need to drill probably five meters. So these are the two sites I would want to go on Mars. Phoenix drill deep enough to get into the ice to get the remnants of habitability from 5 million years ago. At the Gale site, drill in here deep enough to get below radiation penetration over billions of years, 5 meters. So my uh, view of Mars is drill. Drill, baby, drill. <laughs> it's good advice. Uh, that's what we need to do on Mars. But the other world I wanted to talk about uh, tonight in terms of searching for evidence of life is Enceladus. This is a little moon of uh, Saturn, shown here. It's uh, surrounded by this cloud of material that's called the E-ring. Um, and uh, the E-ring is peculiar because it shouldn't be there. It's dynamically unstable. That, that, that ring should go away quickly. But it's there, so it indicates that there must be a source of particles. And people had conjectured that it was coming from Enceladus as, as geysers of some sort. Uh, and that was spectacularly confirmed by Cassini in 2005. Cassini took pictures showing this amazing plume coming out of the South Pole. No one appreciated just the splendor of, these, of this site. Uh, and the flux of water coming out is about equal to the flux of Old Faithful Geyser, all concentrated in a narrow, in a small region in the South Pole, just jets of water shooting out into space. And even more interesting, it's an organic soup. There's organics all the way up to the measurement capability of the instruments on Cassini, which were not designed to characterize this plume. We've learned so much about this plume from Cassini, all in some sense serendipitously, because Cassini was not built with this job in mind. And yet the team was able to turn it to this analysis and generate a lot of really amazing insight into the plume and the subsurface uh, nature of the source. And it's clear that it's, it's a soup. It's got organics. Uh, it's got biologically available nitrogen in the form of ammonia. It's got everything uh, organisms can eat. If you were to bottle this soup and bring it to Earth, there's lots of organisms on Earth that could live in it. Um, and uh, methanogens, in particular, would love it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's clearly evidence of habitability 
in the sense of the chemical requirements. And we know uh, from uh, elemental information that it comes from a subsurface ocean that is in contact with hot rocks. And the hydrothermal activity is what's driving the, uh, the uh, chemical nature of the system. So this is uh, very, very interesting. And it's analogous to um, a, a system on Earth that was discovered the same year, 2005, uh, the Lost Hills hydrothermal vent, which is a cool alkaline hydrothermal vent, not one of the hot black smokers that have been known for years. These are cooler and more interesting biologically for that reason. The black smokers are so hot that the inside of the black smokers are too hot for life. Life lives on the periphery where that hot water interacts with the seawater and it works on the chemistry at that interface. This is cool enough that life is living inside it. This was discovered by Deborah Kelly and her team at the University of Washington. It's not a perfect analog to Enceladus because of the oxygen in the seawater allows for things like crabs to grow at these vents. But it's a very interesting uh, analog, and we think that this is the sort of process that's going on in Enceladus. So we have hydrothermal vents producing a rich, habitable soup with all the nutrients needed for life, chemical energy, liquid water, chemical energy available for biology, nitrogen available for biology, and organic material. All the main habitability. And this is now. On Mars, we were talking about habitability in the past, looking for remnants of life five million years and several billion years old. On Enceladus, we're looking at for something that's habitable right now, putting out environments. And the best thing is there's a big sign, free samples, take one. Uh, and so we're, we want to do that. And the exciting thing right now is there's a lot of mission designs to go to Enceladus and fly through the plume and take samples and analyze them. But I want to pick one that's a little bit beyond what we can do now because it illustrates an important point, I think, in astrobiology. And that is a sample return mission. So we started a project to try to propose a sample return mission where we bring a piece of that plume back to Earth. Uh, we call it the LIFE mission. Very cleverly chosen acronym. Do you get it? LIFE, L-I-F-E. Uh, and we're, we want to propose it as a joint US and Japanese mission. Uh, the reason is, is that the US and Japan are the only two countries who have done sample return missions from beyond the moon. Uh, the US successfully did the Stardust mission, and Japan successfully did the Hayabusa mission. Stardust was a return from a comet. Hayabusa was a return from an asteroid. So we want to propose a joint mission. Uh, we want it to be joint uh, because international cooperation is a good thing, but it also reduces the budget. We want to propose it to what's called the Discovery uh, Program at NASA. That's a, a budget cap that's too small to accommodate a big mission like this, but big enough to accommodate half of a mission like this. So we've been working on that. I want to tell you a little bit about it. And first, to show you an artist's conception of the mission. You know you're serious at NASA when you have an artist's conception. <laughs> but you know, you really know you're serious when you have an animation of that artist's conception. OK, so here's the animation of the NASA bus. Uh, that's why it's got the meatball and the antenna. And the Japanese probe that flies through the plume and grabs a sample, tucks it in, and then returns that to Earth. So this is the only piece that comes back to Earth. And you see the name of it is Sua which is a glacier a geyser in Japan. It's the only geyser in the world, big geyser in the world, with a short name that will fit on the side of a spacecraft. You can't write Old Faithful on the side of a spacecraft. So again, that's the NASA bus. So NASA would build the bus, uh, just like Cassini. And then a partner would build the probe, just like the Huygens probe. That's why I said Cassini is our programmatic model. Uh, and uh, so that's the NASA bus. The bus would, of course, continue to fly through the Enceladus Saturn system and do in situ science while the probe grabs a piece of the material and brings it back to Earth. Um, and I like this mission because sample return ultimately is what we have to do to complete our understanding of life uh, elsewhere, is bring a sample back. No matter how much we do in situ, I think we're always going to want to bring it back because the analytical precision and understanding that would drive from that in Earth laboratories greatly exceeds what we can ever send into space. Uh, but bringing a sample back is not easy. Uh, so here I say the challenge of returning a sample to Earth from an astro as astrobiological sample, which might contain life from a habitable world, 
Uh, and I illustrated with this picture, which is the third sample return from beyond the Earth-Moon system. This one was done by the US. It's Genesis, brought back a bit of the solar wind, and it crashed on landing. And that's what this is a picture of. Um, now, Stardust, Hayabusa, and Genesis, they were what the rules call unrestricted sample return. Or decoding, that means nobody cares if it crashes, except, of course, the scientists who are <laughs> invested in the samples. But it's you know, not, a, not a public uh, disaster. But if we're bringing back a sample from Enceladus that's got an Earth-like ocean, and we're bringing it back because we hope there's life in it, and we crash it and break it open, uh, that's, that's not a good idea. Not only is it not a good idea, it's against the law, international law. The United States is bound by a treaty which prevents us from doing that. It's not just up to NASA to decide it's not a good idea. It's not really up to the administration. It's actually set in international law. Uh, so this is a big problem. How do you bring back a sample that you hope has life in it? Right? This would be what the technical would be described, a restricted sample return. And that's the challenge we face. When we tried to push this through as a discovery mission, uh, JPL has this process they call the gate review, which is another way of saying this is where we weed out the ones that we're not going to support from the ones that we are. Uh, and they basically said, you can't propose this because you don't know how to cost your return, because you don't know how to design your return, because you don't even know what the rules are that govern your return, because no one's ever tried to do this before. So there are no rules. So we're pushing on that. So the pushing will start at a meeting this summer in Istanbul, where the committee, the international committee that makes the rules for these kind of things, called Planetary Protection, meets. Uh, and, but I've done some advanced thinking, as I always do. So I'm going to show you my solutions. But I emphasize that these are just my solutions. I see there's two solutions to bringing back a sample, to solving what I call the last mile problem, getting that sample the last mile to the Earth safely so you can put it in a containment facility. Once you have it on Earth, we know how to deal with it. There are two solutions. One is have astronauts meet the sample in orbit. So you bring the sample back to orbit, a big looping orbit, for example. Astronauts fly up and get it, bag it, bring it back. That has two advantages. One, astronauts, by definition, are in human-rated vehicles, which are tested much more rigorously than robotic vehicles. And second, you have a human-in-the-loop safety system. If, like Genesis, the parachute doesn't deploy, you know, uh, Jack turns to Jill and says, hey, Jill, the parachute didn't deploy. And she says, OK, manual override. And they override it. That's a human-in-the-loop safety system. And it's true and it's intuitive that that works better. And it will, when I say it's intuitive, it means that the public appreciation of the risk will be mitigated by the knowledge that there's a human bringing it back to get it to Earth. But, but while I prefer this solution, we can't propose that. That's just not allowed in the rules of the discovery program, right? Uh, that's another part of NASA. You know, we're not allowed to talk to them in the context of a discovery program. NASA is sometimes amazingly stovepiped in terms of what you can propose under different programs. Well, that's OK. So that mean, but it does mean that we have to come up with a robotic entry system that's 100% fail safe. It can't, you know, to use that famous s s saying, nothing can possibly go wrong. We really have to implement that in engineering. Well, how can you do something that can't possibly go wrong? Well, it reminds me of the safety courses we take. How to do nothing wrong is do nothing. Don't move, don't think, don't make any decisions. And if you're cynical, you can see that as the root of the safety uh, office's message when they brief you on safety. Uh, just kidding. I love the safety folks. That's my official position. That's my official position, and I'm sticking with it. But that's actually an element of truth. If, you, if you're coming into Earth and you don't require a parachute, you don't require any mechanisms, you don't require any decisions, you can't make any wrong decisions. Right? So, you design a vehicle that's designed to crash. It doesn't have a parachute. It has no deployable mechanism. All it has to do is obey the law of gravity. Fly in and crash. It lands at terminal velocity. You've designed it to land at terminal velocity. And you take as your model meteorites, which successfully deliver organics to the surface of the Earth day after day uh, without parachutes, without airfoils, without any guidance mechanisms. They don't even have onboard computers. They just come crashing in and hit the ground, and there's the organics intact on the surface, right? If meteorites can do it, we can do it. So now, you, 
the, the, the logical comment then is, well, you don't get much sample. Yeah, but we don't need much sample. With instruments that we have today, we could do all the things we want to do with a sample the size of a thumbnail. So that's, the, that's my suggestion. That will be my suggestion to our engineering team and my suggestion to the rule writers, bring in a sample this way uh, and just make sure, design your spacecraft so it will land. It's got an added benefit that you know where it's going to land. One of the problems with using a parachute anyway is once the vehicle gets on the chute, the wind takes it. You don't know where it is. And you've got to send helicopters out to look for it. Whereas if it's just coming in like a meteorite, it's like a ballistic missile. You know exactly where it's going to be. You're going to be there to catch it. And then what are you going to do? You're going to, if it's a joint mission and Japan is doing the sample return, if they did what they did to Hayabusa, it will come to Australia and they'll fly it to a ship that will be in dock in, uh, I think it's Port Hedland up in the north. Um, and they'll have a biocontainment facility in that ship. They've got mobile biocontainment facilities. Japan is one of the leading oceanographic uh, research countries in the world. They view this problem as not a planetary mission, but an oceanographic mission. Uh, so I think that's an interesting way to think about it. A voyage to Enceladus is an oceanographic voyage. Uh, and so it, it's appropriate that the sample would come back and be tested in a ship for safety, and then once it's determined safe, it would sail back to Japan. The sample would be shared between the US and Japan. So on Mars, we have two targets, Europa, or sorry, Enceladus, we have one. We, can have, we may find organic material that's biological. So then the question is, how do we recognize alien life? How do we recognize a second genesis? Remember, I opened this talk by saying, what I want to find is something that's not on our tree of life. It's not like us. Well, how do we recognize something that's not like us? So I want to focus on that. Uh, here is the standard methods. <laughs> standard method number one is use a tricorder. And again, remember episode 26, silicon life. And 100, kilometer, 100 miles of rock detects silicon life. But unfortunately, we don't know the physical principle by which a tricorder works. Not only do we not know it, Lawrence Krauss, the author of The Physics of Star Trek, doesn't know it. Uh, and you can look up the physics of Star Trek. There's no explanation for how a tricorder works. Uh, I searched. You, know, you can get photon torpedoes and force shields and teleportation and all these other things, warp drive, but not the tricorder. The second approach uh, that you find in the literature is what I call the Justice Potter Stewart approach, which is we'll, we'll know it when we see it. Well, that's true, and that works for things that are big and alive and are chasing you or you're chasing them or they're just growing. You could think of this as the culture-dependent method. You grow it up, and if it grows, it's alive. Right? Unfortunately, there's nowhere in our solar system where we're likely to find anything that's alive. Uh, even in Enceladus, it's likely to be dead by the time we get the sample into our instruments. So how, we're going to have to take a different approach. So the approach that we're taking is a biochemical approach to look at how life selects biochemistry biochemicals that it uses in a different way that chemistry does. And so I'm going to show a couple technical graphs, but they illustrate an important point, which I'll explain in a more simple way after I explain it in a technical way. And you'll say, well, why did you explain it in a technical way in the first place? Well, just bear with me. So this is a plot of what you'd expect the concentration of molecules to be if there's nothing but chemistry acting. All the molecules would be there more or less at uniform concentrations. Similar molecules would have similar concentrations. Left and right-handed versions would be present at the same concentrations. But life picks certain molecules and uses them much more frequently. So for example, life uses L amino acids much more than it uses D. And so it's a non-statistically uniform distribution. So life is a signature. When you look at the organic molecules in a living thing, they're very different than the organic molecules in something that's produced non-biologically, like a meteorite or a Miller-Urey experiment. You might expect alien life to have that same property, but with different molecules. So that's the technical explanation. Let me explain it to you in a simple term, uh, which is the way I think about it, in terms of Lego blocks. Okay? Lego blocks, uh, you say you want to build a house out of Lego blocks. What you do is you get a bunch of identical blocks and stack them in different ways, and you can make many different structures from stacking them that way. Uh, that's how life approaches things. It takes uh, 
makes intermediate level complexity molecules like amino acids and whatnot, and it uses them in a certain form and only in a certain form. Lego blocks are not just all different types and shapes. There are certain types and shapes only. So there's a big difference between, say, a stack of Legos and just a pile of rocks that you find in your yard. Right? The Lego blocks have discrete shapes like the discrete lines I showed on the graph. But the important point is, is there's different ways to do that. In fact, when I was a kid, we didn't play with Legos. They hadn't been invented yet, in fact. In fact, plastics hadn't been invented yet. We played with uh, wooden blocks called Lincoln Logs. None of you are old enough to remember those, but Lincoln Logs were made out of wood. And it's an interesting comparison. They're made out of the same elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, plastic, and wood. And when we go to Mars and Enceladus, we're going to find life that's also made out of carbon and water. Uh, because the reason these worlds are interesting is because they contain water and carbon. So life there is going to be the same elements. And ecologically, the life is going to be the same. But it's going to choose different molecules to build its building blocks with than we choose. So different amino acids, different, different molecules in this intermediate level of complexity. Uh, and that's what we would try to detect. We try to detect uh, a different set of basic building blocks between our life and that life. Now let me give you a very specific example which I think is a powerful one that we would, could implement on missions right now, and that is amino acids. So if you think of, a, imagine a diagram of all possible amino acids. There's hundreds of them, many hundreds of them. Life uses 20. So life on Earth uses 20 amino acids out of the whole possible set of thousands of them. Right? 10 of those 20 it probably inherited from, the inter, from prebiotic conditions, but the other 10 it invented. So this is life on Earth. You can imagine life somewhere else using a different set. Okay, so it's, it's not that it's completely weird life. It's not like Fred Hoyle's black cloud or Robert Forward's neutron life. It's still amino acids. It's still going to look very familiar. In fact, we could probably eat it. Right? It's going to be made out of the same chemicals, but in a different section of selection of them. Right? Different selection of amino acids with some in common. And there's some papers, for those of you that care, working out how that could be uh, biologically implemented. There's another level of choice in these amino acids, not just does life use a particular set. As I've indicated before, life uses a particular handedness. Life on Earth uses only left-handed amino acids and proteins. All the proteins in your body are made only of left-handed amino acids, not the right-handed ones. Uh, and that almost certainly is just an accidental quirk of history, just like we in the United States drive on the left side of the road. Or is it the right? I never get that right. We drive on one side or the other. right? Uh, and it's because things work better that way. Right? The same in the amino acids. You can't make big, long protein chains if you've got left and right mixed together. You've got to all go left or all go right. Life on Earth is all going left. So all of our, our selectivity, if you think back to those graphs, is for left-handed amino acids. So that means life elsewhere not only could have different amino acids, it could have the mirror image. So the possibilities are shown here. You could have different amino acids and different chirality. So the best possible scenario is we find on another world all right-handed amino acids with some overlap with our amino acids, but not all. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would tell us right away that there was life, that it was a second genesis, and it would tell us something about its uh, biochemistry. Uh, now, I want <clears throat> to talk a little bit about what will we learn from this. Um, and I want to start with going back to the origin of life. I mean, commented earlier, we don't know where or when or how it started. Uh, let me show you some of the current theories. I've tried to uh, show them in a simple way. What are the current theories for where life on Earth came from? Uh, there's two theories that suggest life on Earth came from other worlds. One is that life started on Mars, knocked off the meteorites, and carried to Earth. Uh, so you might have heard discussions, we are Martians, because uh, rocks carrying life from Mars came to Earth early in Earth history, when Mars was a better place to live than Earth. Uh, and so life started here and came there. The other possibility that's discussed is, in fact, life doesn't just predate the Earth, but it predates the whole solar system. The life came into the 
solar system with the stuff that formed the sun and the planets, and its seeds are in the comets in the outer part of the solar nebula, and those seeds have planted in all the planets. So life has come to all the planets from precursors that are interstellar, effectively. So life could have come from another planet. Life could have come from the stars. In the side of the folks who think that life started on Earth, right now there's two really strong schools. One is that life started in a hydrothermal vent, lost city vent in particular, our Enceladus-like vent. Uh, another school says, no, life started on the surface in a hot evaporite pool. And here are the uh, prime component or proponents of these theories. And if you apply these theories to Enceladus, they make clear, unambiguous predictions. And I tested this by sending this view graph to these guys, Mike Russell, who's at JPL, who thinks, yes, life will have started on Enceladus. He is as sure as sure can be that he knows how life started. It started in lost city-like vents, and those are what we have on Enceladus. You'll find life in the plume. Dave Deemer uh, at UC Santa Cruz is equally sure that life started in an evaporative pond on the surface. And when I told him it's just underwater, no, no way to evaporate, he says no. Uh, and uh, that's very interesting. So he would predict we'll fly through the plume of Enceladus and there won't be anything there because uh, life can't get started underwater. It needs drying and wetting cycles. Right? Um, and these guys are very smart and very persuasive. When I sit to a talk by one of them or the other, I'm, I believe whoever spoke last. Uh, they're just really, uh, uh, really quite, they, they, it's a quite puzzling debate. It's a debate that can only be resolved by going and looking. And here's how we could resolve it. If we, if we look at the Earth, Mars, and Enceladus, what will we learn by searching for life there and looking at how it compares to us? So if all of them are the same, if we find life on Earth and life on Mars, and it's the same on our tree of life, that tells us that Earth-Mars exchange may have occurred. And then we would expect different life on Enceladus because it's farther out. Maybe Earth and Mars were talking, but Enceladus was left out in the cold. So this would say planetary exchange. But if we found that we had the same on all three worlds, Earth, Mars, and Enceladus, all with the same life on the same tree of life, well, I'd be personally disappointed. But scientifically, it would tell us that the likely explanation is that life came in in a way that seeded the entire solar system. Uh, so that tells us that we may go out to a nearby stars and still find life just like us. That means that one may indeed be the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Uh, the next part of that song, as you may remember, is two is, can be as bad as one, and that's all wrong. And I tell them, and I hear that song on the radio, and I call up and I say, you know, I'd like to offer a comment. Uh, you know, two is much, much better than one. Uh, and it's all the way to infinity. But they never play the comment on the air. I don't know why. But anyway, uh, we can try. Uh, now, if we find life on Earth and Mars, that's consistent, if they're different or the same, it's consistent with an origin on land. And then we wouldn't expect it on Enceladus. So if we get yes, yes, no, that's telling us that water underwater is not where it's at. Water worlds are no good. You need land worlds, land and water worlds. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if it's yes, 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 then that strongly points to hydrothermal vents because that's all Enceladus has to offer. Mars and Earth have hydrothermal vents, but they've got other things too. But now we've found the common denominator, and now we know where to look when we look elsewhere. Look for the hydrothermal vents. So the point I'm trying to make here is that searching for life is not just checking the box. There are scientific implications of our knowledge of how life is, how it started, and its biochemistry and how it works, and what uh, derivations are. I now want to zoom in on one question that may be in your mind. Well, why do we really need a sample return to do this? Couldn't we search for these amino acids uh, in situ? And the answer is yes. We could do this analysis in situ. And there's mission proposals to go to Enceladus to do this level of analysis in situ. So why am I so passionate about a sample return? Here's why. And sorry for all the words on this chart. The point is, is that if nature life on Enceladus conforms to our expectations, 
and life on Enceladus does indeed use amino acids and fits the nice little picture I just described, then we can learn everything we want to learn just by sending a probe there. But it turns out, as we've learned in past missions, nature does not have a good record of conforming to our expectations, right? Uh, it gives us big surprises. Perchlorate on Mars is one. Uh, the lack of a global ocean on Titan is another. Uh, sometimes we are all sure we know the answer, we being the science community. We're all in consensus. We're all sure you couldn't get funded to do anything else, you couldn't publish a paper or anything else, and then it turns out to be wrong. And this happens surprisingly often in planetary science, which is one reason why I feel at home in that field, because it, uh, it's, it's very humbling. It's just, uh, it, it crops the field very nicely of large egos because they always turn out to be wrong. Uh, and so we can expect to be wrong. And if we're wrong about life, then our, we're, we're just never going to get anywhere because we'll send a mission with a certain set of analysis looking for a certain chemistry, and it won't be there. It'll be something different. And then we'll have to go back to the drawing board and send new, uh, another set of instruments. And that iteration basically is impossible to do remotely. But it takes, it's trivial to do when you have a sample in your hand. And that's why I think we need to learn to do astrobiology sample return. We need to bring the sample back home. Uh, now, I want to, uh, the last part of the science of the talk is what might we learn? What's one example scientifically of what questions we might address by having a second genesis? I alluded to the things we might learn from the tree of life. Let me pick one, ex uh, one or two examples and focus on them. Here again is a tree of life. And you can find all of these organisms in your body. There are human cells, eukarya. There are bacteria cells in your, on your skin, in your teeth, uh, in your intestines, everywhere. And there's also archaea cells on your body, in your body, on your body. We have all three types. You are a walking example of the tree of life. You know, all uh, beautiful biological diversity. Um, and it's interesting that if you look at the human body as an ecosystem made up of members of all three domains of life, there are pathologies that are due to this domain acting up and reproducing without limit. It's called cancer. There's pathologies of this domain acting up and reproducing without limit. It's called microbial infection. But there is no evidence at all that the archaea do anything ever that destroys that little community. There are no pathologies or diseases caused by archaea. Isn't that odd? These guys are bad. These guys are bad. Now, by the way, the coloring, red states and blue states, bad and good. It's completely accidental and predates any politics. Uh, so why is it that these guys don't cause disease? You know, I was working on this about 10 or 15 years ago, and I, I realized that there's no archaeal diseases. My training is in microbiology, so I emailed all my smart microbiology friends, you know, dear smart microbiology friends, why are there no diseases caused by archaea. And they wrote back, dear clueless astrobiologists, there are no diseases caused by archaea because archaea never developed pathogenicity. And, okay, uh, that, uh, thanks for the answer. <laughs> Otherwise read as, we don't know, right? Now it could be that the best approach to antibiotics is to delve deeply into the nature of the organisms that cause disease. It could be an alternative approach is to understand at the level of the tree of life why this whole domain doesn't cause disease and this domain has many, many examples that do. And that comparison might be facilitated by having other trees of life to compare to. I'm not promising an end of microbial infections if we discover the tree of life, but I'm trying to illustrate questions that appear at the level of the tree not at the level of the branches in the tree. And therefore, having more trees is an important part of the data set. Another example is how did the eukaryotic cell arise? We think it arose when the, some, our bacteria cells uh, took up residence inside an archaea cell. And how did this branching even occur in the first place? These are questions about the tree. And I think we'll get a better handle on them when we have other trees to compare to. So that is my uh, attempt to try to connect the, the research we're doing to questions that may be important. 
I want to move now from water worlds and just spend one second on Titan because it's so bizarre. It's a world, it's got a beach. Uh, it's the only world besides Earth that has a beach. So think umbrellas, towels spread out, lemonades, little uh, stirs in them, and lots of heavy clothing because the temperature is minus 180 centigrade. This is obviously not Titan. This is Lake Mead uh, from some BBC shooting they did. Uh, they, that's me standing on the shore of Lake Mead and contemplating that water level is really low because of drought. Uh, they sent me this. They sent me this still and said we CGI'd the scene to make it look like Titan. Right? Lake Mead doesn't really look like this. Uh, I, and I said, well, what do you think? And I wrote him back and I said, well, you know, Titan is actually in the plane of the, is in the orbits in the ring plane. So if you were looking at Saturn from Titan. The rings would be edge on, and they'd really be invisible. But don't change the, uh, the CGI. Leave the rings tilted, because the aesthetics overwhelm the technical correctness. And it just looks so much nicer to have Saturn tilted. Whether it's correct or not, who cares? This is a movie, after all. right? So I don't know what they actually did, but that was my uh, recommendation. So if you see this, and the rings are tilted, you can blame me. Uh, but Titan is interesting because it does have beaches. It does have liquid. Uh, now, our assumption is always that the liquid that life needs is water. Well, this liquid is a lot like water, except it's very cold. It's liquid hydrocarbons. Uh, in fact, it's nothing like water. It's nonpolar. It's not a very good solvent. Uh, things that we take for granted in water don't occur here. Amino acids are useless on Titan. Amino acids need water to work. Uh, what we do know about this life is that it needs energy. All life needs energy. The likely energy source is from consuming hydrogen. This is from a study we did some time ago saying what energy sources exist on Titan that life could use. It turns out they all involve eating hydrogen. So the one thing we can probably say with confidence about life on Titan, if, is it, if it is there, it is eating hydrogen. And so we don't know how to search for it biochemically because we don't know what kind of molecules it uses. But we can search for its effect on its environment. And I point this out by comparison to Earth. Uh, one thing Earth does is it alters, life on Earth does, is it alters its environment. So on Earth, life is carbon-based, water-based, and is widespread because water and carbon are widespread. And as a result, it has global effects. And the global effects on Earth include the oxygen in our atmosphere. It is a pollutant created by life. Right? Billions of years ago, cyanobacteria uh, wrecked the environment by producing large amounts of oxygen. Fortunately, human beings in their wisdom are correcting this mistake, getting rid of the oxygen, and bringing back the carbon dioxide, thereby restoring the Earth to its environmentally correct uh, initial condition. Uh, but that oxygen is a biological pollutant. So is methane that we see in the atmosphere now. And the CO2 cycle that you see going up and down, summer, winter, summer, winter, that's an effect of plants producing CO2, uh, taking up CO2. Uh, so biology on Earth could be detected just by looking at the gases in our atmosphere. Right? So you wouldn't have to know about amino acids and lipids and DNA to detect life on Earth. You could just monitor the atmosphere. Uh, well, that, can we apply that approach to Titan? And the answer is, if it's carbon-based, living in liquid methane, it could be widespread. What would its global effect be? consuming hydrogen. So a prediction of this model is that if we measure hydrogen near the ground on Titan, and if there's an active biology there, it is depleting the hydrogen. And our chemical theory suggests that there shouldn't be anything else depleting the hydrogen. So uh, we are looking into methods of trying to detect the hydrogen as a signature of life. Uh, now, if we see that, if we see some peculiar uh, depletions of hydrogen near the surface, then we'd want to go and look for the, bio, the biomolecules. But we'd be really hard pressed to know what to look for. Go back to this model. You know, here's Earth biology. Titan is going to have a whole different set of molecules way out there. It's going to be a tough to guess at what kind of molecules it uses for things that, for example, life on Earth uses lipids and amino acids for. Uh, so, but I hope we have that problem. OK, I want to end on a philosophical note, which is uh, to rem remind my, my, myself of a question that a student asked me when I gave a talk like this in Death Valley once. Uh, she said, uh, uh, what will you do if you find a second genesis on Mars? I thought, you know, that's a really good question. 
We don't spend much time thinking about that. We spend all our time thinking about how do we find and where do we get the funding and uh, you know, will this program get canceled? So it's like the dog chasing the car. We don't know what we're going to do if we succeed. We are unprepared for success. What does it mean to find another fundamentally different type of life on a nearby world? Uh, well, sure, in my opening talk, I emphasized the scientific and philosophical importance. But there may be ethical implications. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it, if we find another example of life, then the case could be made that there are now three distinct sets that deserve moral consideration. Right now, we have two, humans and life in general. We all realize that there's some moral consideration due to humans. And we all have also have an instinctive sense that there's moral consideration due to life. Uh, it's sometimes a gradient between uh, big cuddly organisms like panda bears at the high end and microorganisms at the low end. We don't really give much attention to microbes. Uh, we kill them by the thousands when we brush our teeth and wash our hands. And I encourage you to continue those heinous acts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we all have a sense that there's something special about life. But now we've got another example of life, distinctly different example. And I would argue that even if the only representatives of that life are microscopic, uh, which, as I just said, they score low moral status based on the usual metric supply of pain, complex behavior, or communication, I would argue that we have to give it high status as being the sole representatives of another example of life. Uh, we would want to uh, not kill it. It would look real bad on our resume when we finally do meet the aliens and they say, well, what have you done? We say, well, we went to the neighbors and we killed them all. It <laughs> uh, doesn't look good. Much better would be we went to the neighbors, they weren't doing so well, and we helped them. Gold star. Right? So I think we need to think deeply about that. And again, I'll offer you my opinion is that that affects, it's not just an idle academic ethical discussion. It has actual implications for how we do exploration now. And I think if you work it through, the logic is that we should make our exploration of Mars in particular, uh, and Enceladus, and anywhere, biologically reversible. That means, for example, in the case of Mars, if we discover that there's life there, and it's a second genesis, we have the capability to undo any contamination we did. The undo command is another one of those wonderful mindsets that have been generated by the computer industry. And I love it. I wish my life had an undo button. <laughs> Many times I would have hammered on it. Undo, undo, undo. Uh, and fortunately, everything we've done on Mars so far, we can undo. We have not introduced uh, irreversible contamination on Mars. There's organisms on Earth from Mars. We sent them there. But they're constrained. They're dormant. They haven't, if they escape the spacecraft, they're killed by the UV. They can't reproduce because there's no water. And they're slowly being killed by cosmic radiation over thousands and thousands of years. But it's not irreversible. The cost of decontamination will be linearly related to the cost of contamination. It's not like rabbits in Australia, where the cost of getting rid of them is virtually impossible. It's exponentially related to the cost of introducing them. It'd be more like putting two rabbits in Antarctica, deciding 10 years later that was a bad idea. You go back, you find the two dead rabbits, and you bring them out. <laughs> you did that experiment. That experiment was done in Australia. They put in two rabbits. Many years later, they decided to get them out, and they just can't get them out. That's irreversible. So far, nothing we've done on Mars is irreversible. And I think we should keep it that way. And this has some implications for how we do human exploration. Uh, doesn't mean we have to sterilize things. We can't. And we haven't. Uh, that barn door has already been opened. Uh, and we don't need to. It doesn't make any sense. We just have to be able to undo it if we discover there's a second. And if we never discover life, then we never have to undo it. And then it's not contamination. It's inoculum. Right? Uh, it's only contamination when there's someone there who, who objects, or we object on their behalf. Uh, and then this is the last slide. And it's my clue to thank you for your attention. Uh, and open it up for questions. OK, uh, question here. I'll repeat the question so that everyone can hear them. Yeah. 
That, that's a good question, a really good question. And I mentioned that we bottled up and carried out all of our organic waste. Uh, but we didn't worry about our natural organisms. The pH of that lake is 10 and a half, and the water's at zero degrees. Nothing that likes to live in or on me likes to live at pH 10 and, and uh, zero degrees. So nothing, none of our organisms would start growing in that lake. The real concern of our impact is not inoculating an organism there that would disrupt the ecosystem, but producing organic material that would affect the balance. Because we, the organic material represented in our camp probably represents many decades of the primary productivity of these mats. And so if we dumped our waste into that watershed, we could affect the, uh, the biogeochemical cycles. So it's a, it's a different concern. It's not a concern of biological contamination. It's a concern of material contamination, eutrophication, if you will. Right, right. Well, the, uh, it's very different if you bring, if, if my pH was 10 and my body temperature was zero, then I would worry about contaminating that lake. And that's the point about Enceladus. That environment, as far as we can tell, is compatible with our oceans. So organisms that like Enceladus are going to like Earth. Uh, that's why it's a much more serious problem than any sample return we've done before. And I, I'm all for, I agree. I don't want Enceladus organisms running amok on Earth. Uh, I'm, I'm not complaining about these rules. I'm just uh, struggling to comply with them, which is different than complaining. <laughs> Question here? You had kind of a, a Freudian slip and mentioned Europa. Uh -huh. I know there's uh, some interest in Europa as a potential source of life. And it's going to be closer because it's, of course, orbits the sun and not Saturn. So right. why Enceladus and not Europa? Well, I'm focusing on near term missions. Oh, sorry, thank you. The question is, how does Europa fit into this picture? Europa is one of the worlds I listed as the worlds that can tell us about the story of life. I didn't go into the details because I don't know how we're going to search for life on Europa. We don't have, I think, a, a real clear strategy because we haven't finished investigating the habitability of Europa. The one thing we know is that there's water and we know it's under a lot of ice. We don't really know how to access it. We don't know if the cracks really bring the water up. We've never found organics yet. There's a lot more we need to do to get Europa to the point where we're ready to say, yeah, now let's go search for life, uh, at least in, in my view. I think Mars and Enceladus, we have identified environments where we can make the case that these are or were habitable, and it's time to go search for life. I don't think we're there for Europa. And in Titan, the problem is very different. Uh, it's not habitability. It's bizarre chemistry that we're searching for. Uh, so. Uh, Europa is certainly an interesting world and is on one of the four worlds that I work on, Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. That's the solar system to me. Uh, none of the, uh, I've removed all the others as planets, including Pluto. They're not planets. Jupiter's not a planet. These are the four. Uh, so yeah, the question was how we get Elon Musk interested in Enceladus. I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I'm not sure I want to get Elon Musk interested in Enceladus. Uh, they might land there and contaminate it. Because uh, the, the converse works true. Organisms from Enceladus would like the Earth's ocean, but organisms from Earth would like Enceladus. It wouldn't be like Mars, where the, rever the contamination would be reversible. If we were to send a craft down the, into the geysers at Enceladus, and it was sterilized only to the level that we've been sterilizing Mars spacecraft, including Viking, we will have contaminated it. And it will grow. It'll be rabbits in Australia, not rabbits in Antarctica. So we have to be very careful touching the water on Enceladus. Uh, now, fortunately, we don't have to touch the water because Enceladus, maybe to protect itself from us, is sending, you guys want it? Here, take it. Just don't come, at, just don't come down my chimney. Uh, so uh, fortunately, we don't have to. We can fly through and get the samples and fly through and do the analysis. But if we ever decide to send something in the water, then I, for one, would argue that we should do medical-grade sterilization, not NASA-grade sterilization. If you go to a hospital and they have a big sign, we sterilize our instruments to NASA specifications, get in your car and go the other way. <laughs> it is not a proper use of the word sterile. Right? It's clean and it's good. You know, it's hard to do anything more. 
You know, if you don't believe that, try sticking your iPhone in an autoclave and seeing what comes out, right? Uh, so, uh, but if we go down the, down the chute in Stellus, or if we discover an aquifer on Mars below the surface and want to drill down to it as a source of water, we've got to learn to do medical quality sterilization to do those missions safely. Uh, and those aren't, that's not in the rules yet, and, but it will be. Uh, the rules system is adaptive, and when opportunities come up, the rules are written for them, which is why there is current rules for Encelada sample return. Question here? Okay, the question was, have we, do we still think we might find complex organics in any of these worlds, regardless of their size? Uh, I don't think size is going to play a big role, first, because the forces that make bring molecules together are almost completely dominated by electrical magnetic forces, electromagnetic forces. Gravity doesn't play much of a role. You know, when you're cooking something and it burns or caramelizing sugar, those are chemical reactions. Gravity isn't very important. So I don't think the size of the planets matters much. And we already have detected complex organics on Titan in its atmosphere uh, and in Enceladus's plume. We haven't characterized them fully, but we know that there is high molecular weight organics in the plume of Enceladus from not an instrument which I showed you, but another one, the German instrument, the particle analyzer. We know that there's uh, very complex organics, and we know indirectly on the INMS data because as the spacecraft went faster, we saw more fragments, and that's interpreted as bigger molecules breaking up from the higher collision speed. So there are complex organic molecules, and in addition, meteorites, which land on Earth, non-biological, they have complex organics, uh, and we can make them in the lab with uh, Miller-Urey type synthesis. So I don't think the problem for life is getting the right organics. Uh, you can think of that as the hardware problem. That's easy. Nature automatically makes the same hardware that life needs. Amino acids made in meteorites, you can make them in your laboratory with a spark discharge. I think the hard problem in the origin of life is not the hardware problem, it's the software problem. Uh, life has a software. We call it the genetic code. It's common to all organisms on Earth. Uh, where did that code come from? We do not yet have the analogous experiment of a Miller-Urey experiment, which is the spontaneous emergence of a self-coding information system uh, due in an abiotic reactor. The only way we know how to write codes is to do it manually. So it's a real problem. No one's got a, I think, even a path to a solution to that problem. So challenges for the next generation. Question here. Yeah. Enough to get to space and use that uh, to sort of prove Michael Russell wrong. You know, Dave Deemer came they, to prove Dave Deemer wrong and Michael Russell right. The question was uh, could we put more advanced instrumentation on one of these probes to not just detect life, determine it's a second genesis, but start doing things like drawing its tree of life? And uh, the question particularly referenced a neat little device called an Oxford nanopore, uh, which is a step in that direction. And in fact, we bought one, and we have a research agreement with this company uh, to explore it. Uh, took it to the Atacama Desert, and we're using it in extreme environments to sequence life in all the environments it wasn't designed to work in. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. And the next thing we're going to try to use it is sequence non-DNA polymers, uh, non-repeating plastics. Uh, so they're focused on DNA. That's great. They're mostly focused. They've done wonderful things. Like they had a big paper in science on the Ebola. They use these little tiny devices, uh, just like the size of a matchbook, uh, to sequence the Ebola virus in the field. So it's wonderful technology. It's not specific to DNA. We're going to show it on plastic. So we could sequence any information-bearing molecule. So life on Enceladus could be using something besides RNA, and we should be able to sequence it with this kind of approach. Uh, we'd like to do that. It's just a question of getting something like that ready to go to space, survive 10 years en route to Enceladus and then work once it gets there. 
Uh, we probably won't be proposing that on the next mission we propose, but it's in the queue. Uh, you know, a postdoc came up to me and said, can I buy a, an Oxford Nanopore and start playing with it? And I said, we don't have any money for that. Buy it anyway. Uh, and she did. <laughs> so yeah, it's really hot technology. I think that's one day going to fly. Question right here? Oh, sorry, last question right here. In one of your, your first few slides, you had likened Mars 5 million years ago to us now. Would it be um, fair to say, or what, like, would it be possible to draw a conclusion that Mars now would be X number of years of Earth future? Oh, OK, let me go back to that slide. That's an interesting question, a really interesting question. It gets to the heart of. Uh, uh, comparative planetology, how do we learn? Yeah, I'll re sorry, thanks for reminding me. I'll repeat the question, which is, could, we, we saw Mars five million years ago. It was in there, wasn't it? Yeah. We saw Mars five million years ago tilted so that the polar regions were warmer, so that the Phoenix site would melt in the summer. And the question was, could Earth uh, be on its way to an ice age and become like Mars is today? Uh, it could. And for a while, there was prediction that Earth was going to enter another ice age. Um, and in fact, there's some people who think that human CO2 production has offset that and canceled that. But in the long term, we know that the fate of the Earth, even if it goes through temporary ice ages, the long term fate of the Earth, Earth is to cook. The sun is getting brighter uh, as it gets older. I think we all do, don't we? <laughs> uh, get brighter as we get older. Um, and uh, it's, the Earth's going to get hotter. It's going to go like Venus. Um, yeah. But uh, there could be a couple of ice ages in the meantime. Uh, if you look back at Earth's history, there are times when Earth was completely covered by ice. And we don't really understand why. And there's an interesting poem, my favorite poem, because it's so short, is by Robert Frost called Fire and Ice. Um, and it opens up with, some say the Earth will end, in, the world will end in fire, some say ice. And he explores that in a beautiful way. Um, you could Google it now. OK, sorry, that was the last question. Thank you all for coming tonight. We would ask you to exit out the back doors, up the stairs, and have a good evening.